Thanks very much, Ian Chatterjee. Thanks very much, Australia's brand new Beatles. Quiet now, please. Don't be idiots to yourself. Thanks very much, brand new Beatles. Thanks very much, Nissan Cedrics. Hello, Australasian ringers and dingers, and welcome to Club Buggery for another Saturday night when too much variety will be barely enough. Tonight, Club Buggery coming to you from the John Bertrand missing missing 25 million. Here at Cabaret Central, fiscally speaking. And to get the sideways samba on the shimmy, let's ask Graham Paging Roy Slavin, who will what captured the wild will and one imagination of the world this week. Pal! Thank you very much, H.G. Nelson. Pauline Hanson. Oh, yes. Uh, look, I went down. I had a look at Pauline Hanson. By golly, that was a speech. It was, wasn't it? It got me all fired up. I look forward to compulsory national service. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I do indeed. It would give us, especially with 2000 looming, the fittest young kiddies in the world. <laughs> Fit as buggery! Yes. And we could draw a bloody big line in the sand mm. and say, anyone, come on, I dare you to come on over. <laughs> come on, Indonesia! Come on, Malaysia! Come on, Dr. Mahathir! <laughs> we will our butts! We will our butts! Oh, look at this! And Mahathir! <laughs> come on, brother! Can you do it? Are you big enough? No, we'd feel very, very confident. <laughs> As I've said so often before, anything that gets guns, kilts and kitties involved, I'm all... I'm, I'm, I'm in! Oh, yes, no, 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 absolutely. Guns and kitties? <laughs> oh, yeah. Count me in! Yes. And with that as a way of setting the scene here in The Missing 25 Million, it's now time to welcome a man who's a swan's freak. Ah. But his sporting interests don't end there. He um. loves whacking a hot dot round a course. He loves hurling something in the air and hitting it with a Schlesinger racket. And he loves casting the experienced eye over a flighty filly in the mounting enclosure. Nissan Cedrics, can you pull on the neatly pressed shorts? Can you don the red and the white? Can you say, plugger, sit this one out, pal. I'll take it from here. Run out into the MCG on that one day in September. Take a big grab in the goal square with 10 seconds on the clock. Calmly shrug off the opposition. Turn round and boot it through and win the match. And in doing so, can you give us the Mike Wallacey story? <laughs> Now, Michael, let's talk swans for a minute or two and let's go back to Saturday night, last Saturday night, in fact, the dying moments of the game and relive a couple of memories here of the swans winning a match against 
the Hawthorne. Uh, yes, the Maxwell gets the ball up there looking for somebody can, can grab. He finds Ruse. Ruse a bit far out for score. That old tired leg he's been dragging around for 31 seasons. Here he comes. He dobs it in. He gets it on its way. It looks as though it could be there with a bit of a... From the audience. Oh, no, it's up there. And a bloke who never takes a mark over his head in 15 years of playing football managed to do the impossible and Crazy gets it. He's out there. There's a trusted, rusted on supporter in his arms. And he score or win it. There's a lot of shyacking from the Hawthorne, the happy team from Hawthorne, and they go home very unhappy. Swans win. How did you feel at that moment just before they took the mark? Oh, well, knowing Cresser, I knew he'd take it. You know. Yes, of course, obviously. <laughs> well, law of averages, it was his turn. <laughs> That's right. They were queuing up there. Uh, look, obviously, uh, looking at the next couple of weeks, who do you see as the main problem? And don't tell me just Essendon next week. Assuming you get past Essendon, who would you rather face, the Bears or North? Uh, Fitzroy do me just yes, fine. No, at the moment. <laughs> yes. Yes. Oh, it's really hard to know. I mean, the top teams are very close, and I think that um, if we make the grand final, which I believe we will, it'll be, it'll be up to us. You know, if we do our best, we can win, um, no matter who we face. Now, your connection with the red and the white goes way back. Uh, I understand you played in the reserves for them. This would be, what, 30 years ago, if not more? Um, <laughs> yeah, it was a long time ago. Yes, you know. yes, okay. <laughs> we had those boots that went up around the ankles. Yeah, with the studs know. that you used to screw on. Yeah. Aluminium studs. Yeah. Uh, now, uh, who would have been playing in the ones in those days for then the South Melbourne side? Bobby Skilton. Oh, yeah, Bobby Skilton, the triple grand low medalist. Yeah. And now a former, uh, you know, prominent commentator. Yeah. And who did you have as a hero? Did you have Bob as Skilts as a hero? Or did I you... used to hate Bobby because uh, coming from Western Australia, I can remember the Victorians coming over and Bobby Skilton and Alan Aylant would be running down the road and all the way to the goal, Subiaco, yes. handballing yes. and making us look pretty silly. So I hated him, but it sort of turned around. Right now, and other players there in the in the in the first who who would have been you know you didn't have that sort of thing where you where you thought oh no I'll model myself on somebody obviously it can't be Bobby Skilton I might model myself on some, a lesser light and try and get into the ones that way no no I'd woken up to myself by then you know <laughs> right <laughs> right and thought I'll seek a career elsewhere yeah <laughs> yes and how did you end up at uh, South Melbourne coming from Western Australia well I went to Melbourne uh, trying out as a journalist I was working for the Age and uh, shared a flat with Graham John who was a very prominent player with. Uh, South Melbourne in those days and went on to become coach and president and uh, he said you know that time he got back into training and so I trained with him and ended up playing a few games. Yes. Mike, yeah. what, you're now patron of the Swans, <clears throat> what does a patron do? I, I mean uh, <laughs> obviously you get good seats to any match you want to uh, yeah. go and see but, but what else what else does a patron do? I mean do you sweep out the clubhouse after the yeah. training sessions or, or what, what do you what do you what no, do you get up to yeah, as patron? It's a really good question there's no handbook you know. No, no. no. Um, I don't know what it's supposed to mean but it's, it's very good for me because it means that uh, I'm in the team. Yes. Uh, don't get dropped to the bench. Yes. <laughs> Uh, no responsibility. Yeah. And yeah, good seats. Yeah. So, do the, uh, do the players have to, I mean, do the players have to be nice to you? I mean, are they told by, uh, you know, Rodney Eade, you know, White Mike's coming, uh, you know, be a bit nice to him, spend yeah. a bit of time with him, he is the patron. Yeah. Uh, don't patronise him, just be friendly. Yeah, sure. Uh, I'm the only guy in the club who calls Plugger Sir. Is that right? <laughs> is that right? But are the players nice to you? Do they say, oh, jeez, mate, good to see you, yeah, uh, etc.? No. <laughs> they, well, they say, say, who? Who's that bloke that's hanging around all the time? <laughs> yeah. um, well, a couple of them have told me that their mothers used to like me. Yeah. Oh, no. <laughs> now, what, romantically or in television terms? <laughs> Yeah, television. Television yeah. too. Now, you've been breeding uh, horses very, very successfully, and I think recently your soldiers stud. Um, What's the secret to breeding? I, I mean, it seems to me a oh, weird. Well, how do you determine that this stallion's going to go with this mare? Because it seems to me, even on human terms, if you if you got say Ron Clark and Maureen Caird and got them to produce a kitty, there's no guarantee that the kitty's going to be a reasonable runner. No. You know what I mean? So how no, do you apply this with horses? But the, the kid would bring a lot in the ring. <laughs> of course. What well, has a potential runner? Yeah, I mean, the sale ring. You would you pay a lot yeah. for the, you know. Um, there's an old saying in breeding, you know, put the best to the best and hope for the best. But that means the gene pool gets smaller and smaller and smaller and you're just getting loony horses. <laughs> yeah. Loony horses. Don't you yeah. think, well, I might break out of the mould and go and get some wild yeah. brumbies to put a bit of new blood into the stock. No, the horses are a bit mad. That's why you don't see big people riding them. <laughs> in fact, they all trace back to the same three, don't they? Uh, there's a very small gene pool to three. start with. Yeah. You know, uh, That'd be two, wouldn't it? Two. Oh, yes, <laughs>
<laughs> Unless I know something you don't. <laughs> Uh, look, uh, just before we leave... <laughs> no, but have you made any, any winners? What, what's your big bloody note in horses? I, I mean, have you come up with a manicado or any of those? What's, what's your big bloody horse that's come out of your stable? Um, Rubiton would oh, be yes. the best. Oh, yes. Yes. Somebody liked his run once. Remember? Somebody liked Rubiton's <laughs> run? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah, he had one good run in him, didn't he, Rubiton? <laughs> No, he had a lot of good runs in him. He was, he Where's was... Rubiton these days? I mean, did you give him the bullet or is he out... Uh... No, he's doing what we'd all like to do. <laughs> no. Oh, he's a mad bloody... Yeah, he has winter off. Mm. Yeah. And uh, he gets about, uh, you know, 70 mares a year and he's doing very well. Now, well, that's, well, that's not surprising because horses have been long associated, in, but, you know, in literary terms, in historical terms, with virility. Is that what drew you to horses? <laughs> that, uh, you know, their capability to, at the drop of a hat, to be able to be on the job, so to speak. I mean, is, it, is that what drew you to horses? Um, in my star signs, I'm a double horse. Oh, yes. Right. <laughs> does that, well, what does that mean, genetically speaking? Yeah, I have no idea. <laughs> you I'm can no do idea. it with yourself and produce something. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it means. <laughs> Double yeah. horse? Double horse. What, is that, is that in your Chinese firmament? Like yeah, that's a horse in the side? Chinese and, and somewhere else. Right, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's a big rap. It is. Yeah. Have you, run you. The, <laughs> have you ever ended yourself for the 1600 metre side ram week? You know, so, uh, just to see how it would work out? Yeah, but when I saw the handicap that I was given, I... Yeah, oh, you immediately knew scratch. the game was crooked. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you relate to the world of racing? Obviously, there's breeding here and there's racing there, which are entirely different things, as nearly as I can tell. That breeding almost has, well, has some effect on the speed of the horse, but then, of course, we have other things that influence the speed of the horse. Yeah, I never... <laughs> yeah, well, they should be different, but they overlap, you know. if You, you can't really breed without being interested in racing and... Yeah. And do you uh, <clears throat> look at a horse and think uh, in the, in the, when they parade, you know, think, oh, that's got no chance and that one has and all this sort of stuff? Is you a practiced eye in no. this regard? No. No, no, no. 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 You're more the science, uh, you know, the science of it. You know, obviously we've got, uh, you know, uh, well, I don't know, Let's Elope. And uh, if we get Let's Elope with, um, say... Um, Rubiton. Well, Rubiton, we might get a horse that could run 1,400 metres pretty quick. Oh, probably 2,000. 2,000, right. That's the theory, but the other thing, oh, well, this horse has got a really sort of odd back. There's a bit of a hole there where we could put a bloody battery if needs be. <laughs> Let's breed some up, so, you know, your battery specialists. There, you, you know, is there any of that sort of idea come to horses? <laughs> no. I don't know. No. Uh, just, just uh, sorry, just comment on the media for, for a moment. I, I, th I think I noticed a comment you were saying that, uh, that uh, a good way of losing money would be to get into pay TV. And with, I think, Galaxy posting a $200 million loss uh, yesterday, that's pretty canny advice. Uh, I mean, why is there so much money going in, as you see it, uh, into pay TV when basically it's pretty hard to convince the Australian public to pay money for rubbish? Uh, is that the way you see it? No. <laughs> well, why do you think it's a dud of an idea? Okay, well, in, to, to do some very rough sums, in Britain, which is about four times our population, yep. at the time they went to pay TV, they had about half the television services and they went broke to the tune of billions. Yep. So four times the population, half the TV, that's about eight times more likely than us to be successful and they went broke. Yeah. So we're eight times more likely to go broke and they did. Well, can't Rupert and Kerry read these sorts of signs in the UK? Or are they... Yeah, they, of course they can, and they know better than anybody else, but they're very competitive and, and somebody will have to buckle. And ultimately, I think the two major uh, networks will get together and, and in the That's long sort of... term, getting some money out of telephony and stuff, you know, they're, they're claiming territory and they'll lose billions in the meantime. Right. So it is a crazy thing to... to well, I've already done that. And so that there'll be a sort of Foxtus or something. There'll be a marriage. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. In breeding terms. Yeah. 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 What is going to produce they, who And knows? they do breed. You know, you just put two lines up there, the next thing yeah. is like wire yeah. coat hangers. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. No, no, it looks good. Going back to the swans, if we could. Uh, you know, obviously you've seen a lot of highs and lows with the club in Sydney in particular. I've actually seen a lot more lows. <laughs> yes, I was going to say, yes. A lot of bloody lows. What was the lowest point? Can you picture that? No, I've blotted that out very yes. effectively. Yes. And, uh, I remember you know, everything that happened this year. Yeah, no, it's been a wonderful year. But, uh, you know, when you looked at the club uh, obviously struggling in Sydney, did you think, 
you know, well, I, I've got to sort of, you know, one of those idiotic passions or, you know, idiotic approaches to this that I'm going to hang in there and even if it didn't win this year, I'd wait till next year and maybe they get another yeah, couple of players yeah. and so on. Absolutely. That you're rusted on. Yeah, I mean, I had a basic belief that, I mean, I love the game and I want it to be national and to be national it has to be in Sydney and I know that no matter, no matter how badly we went in Sydney with such a very large city and only one team, we, we, if we just persisted and turned around and started to win, then would come the support, the crowds, the attendances, television ratings, sponsorship, and that's happening. And in fact, this year probably exceeded wild, on the latter, on the last few things, wild, uh, you know, beyond all expectations. All of them, yeah. You know, we would have been happy this year to get into, scrape into the finals, number seven or eight, and we got number one, and you know, Wow. Mike, what are you going to get up to now? I, I, I read another comment that suggested you were getting a little bit bored with things. Uh, would you like to come back to TV? Would you like to come back, say, to the ABC, uh, where you started all those years ago? It might have been Four Corners. Would you like to come back to TV? You'd wipe the floor with your, with your, with your rays and your bloody yarnas and your Johnny Bongiornos and all that rubbish. <laughs> are you interested in coming back? And you know, giving us those listening skills again, because as an, as an interviewer, you are a great listener. <laughs> Any thoughts? You know, I'm prepared to make an offer on behalf of Brian Johns here tonight and say, come on back. What do you think? <laughs> Can we do this in a Hold it, hold it. That you, you, you were interrupting my listening. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> Can I just see another idea? Can I just see another idea? In horse terminology, in horse terminology, that would be no. That would be yes. <laughs> uh, that'd be a very clever horse. <laughs> that'd be a double horse. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's right, with three parents. Yeah. And that's it for that. It's going to wish Michael every success with his ABC future. And I ask everybody, whether here in the 25 million or there at home, to get them out and bang them, and bang them until they look like a couple of freshly slaughtered lumps of rump steak at the end of the rest of the way of thanking Michael Willisey. <laughs>
you know. And they think, they think bloody hell. They get under stress. <laughs> under stress. And you can see them under stress. Oh, yeah. And when they're under stress, they think, oh, well, bloody hell, we better breed up. Yeah. <laughs> under stress. Run down. Next thing you know, they're really panicked anywhere. Yeah, no, yeah. You stick them in your pants. Yeah. Buy an overseas ticket. Bicycle clip. Bicycle clip around the bottom. Yeah, pull Up their the teeth shirt. out. Yeah. They're going to bite you. Yeah, that's right. And with a fat pants, you walk on. That's right. QF 14, straight to America. You ring up Richard Gear. Richard, I've got a load on board. You want me to come round? You know, isn't that the case? Richard. He says, HG Roy, slow, glad how to see you. How many have you got? Yeah, how many have you got? I've got a trouser full, fella. He reaches in, pulls out the wallet, opens it up, and starts counting them out. And when you get a big stack like this, you say, stop, Richard, that's far too generous. I'll open it. That's right. Well, there are a couple yeah. dead, but there are a couple there. Just put in a bit of rock and some water. And Slade, come on, feel the noise. Oh, look, it's easy. Yes, it's really easy. And I must say that a lot of people, uh, you know, worry about Australian platypuses going to New York. And being, and being, you know, they're obviously plats in New York a flavour of the month. And, uh, you know, let's face it, they won't, be, they won't be as popular next year as they are this year. And a lot of people in Australia worry about the future of the platypus once it's reached its use-by date. Mm. Well, they're flushed down the toilets of America into the sewer system and they breed up a treat <laughs> in the sewer system. Sure, sometimes you get a plat this long. Monster plats. Monster plats. And they've grown teeth to eat their way through the mullet in there. But apart from that, they're perfectly at home and there's nothing to worry about at all. But it does raise the question, Roy, of is it cruel to take an animal? And let's face it, we'll use Larry Fortensky's place. He's got more Australian fauna in his backyard than are in the whole of the state of Tasmania. Uh, I mean, he's got species there I've never even seen oh, in no, Australia. No, no, no. Now, is it cruel to send those animals which love a sort of nice, warm, subtropical climate over to his place where it's freezing cold and snows yeah. in the middle of winter? Is yeah. that cruel? Look, I don't think so. I should... <laughs> animals can really adapt. Yeah. You know, they adapt. And you, you've got to go back... So when Australia was part of South America and part of Gondwana... Yes. You know, I've been over there in Central America and looked at some fossils, and you see old platypuses there, mm. right up high in the Andes. Oh, yeah, yeah. They're used to the cold. Yeah. <laughs> They've just got slack. Yeah. Bludgeon here in Australia, not producing any money. Yeah, no, that's right. that's oh, no, no, don't come be with your bloody, you know, sob stories about bloody plats. Yes. They've just been budging as nearly as I can tell for about 50 million bloody years. Yes, yes. Now, Roy, the post pack system, you know, those tubes you get from the, uh, the post office. <coughs> put a bit of mince in. Or... That's right. And in they go. They're as stupid as buggery. And when you get about 40 in there, you just put the other end on, stamp it, and off it goes to Richard oh, Gear. Oh, He's got an incredible appetite, Richard. If I, I can give you his number later on, just ring the ABC switchboard. And uh, if you do have a few at home, he likes anything. You know, obviously, blue tongue lizards, frilly neck lizards, they're a favourite. He doesn't mind geckos. if the tail drops off, no, either. Geckos. He loves a few geckos. And, uh, you know, I know. I fooled him a lot by painting cockroaches with a bit of red paint on the back and calling them red back spiders. Uh, you can do that with your Americans because they're so stupid. stupid. <laughs> I don't know about anything in Australia. But I must say, I must say that it's a wonder that no one has thought of this before. Oh, I know. Look, it'll go through the roof. And I'd like to think, you know, Kitty's now at home with Mum and Dad. Uh are planning an adventure, an excursion, yeah. out into the wild to get a bit of this bloody rubbish uh. and turn it into very, very attractive export dollars. Oh, yes. I mean, this uh. is the future, uh. and it'll save the species. It will indeed. All Australian animals won't be alive here, they'll be alive over yes, there. Yes, over there. <laughs> Which is something will just get barren, doesn't it? That's right. Let's face it. Just uh, quickly, Roy, if we might, and I feel as though we have to uh, comment on this, changing the subject to uh, totally, is the at a glittering star-studded occasion earlier this evening, the, the Olympic logo for the year 2000 was launched. Uh, Roy, what do you make of it? Oh, look, I like it. <laughs> I don't know what it is. It's going to confuse the world, I, I know that, but it'll keep them guessing for, uh, for about four years. <laughs> look, I'm very disappointed, Roy. Look, I, I think we should have had something like a Tasmanian tiger oh, yes. as our logo. Uh, they reckon there are still a few about. Uh, uh, it would galvanise the public of Tasmania to get out there and have a good look. Beaten sticks, just with <laughs> sticks and bags, <laughs> form a big bloody line, throw them, get them, give them a corner. Because yeah. they're in that horrible horizontal scrub down yeah. in the southeast. They're there. Yeah. They're there looking. Yeah. Tasmanian tigers are snooted. Tigers are snooted. I'm trying to find them. Pick them up. Run away with there. it. Watching the show, Tassie Tigers. I can see you. Don't think you're fooling me for one minute. Yeah, I thought, you, I thought you'd get away with it there, didn't you? I'm awake up to you lot. <laughs> We're coming. <laughs> We're coming, baby. That's right. Roy. Bag. Right. Roy, 
and a post pack. <laughs> and a post pack. <laughs> now, Roy, was it worth 300000 and we, we, you know, was this whole effort worth 300000 Well, well I How think... are we going to say cheap? <laughs> I don't know. Uh, I think there are a few blokes giggling tonight. Yes. Thinking, you know, looking at the money. 300000 <laughs> for that. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> Look, I had an idea for a logo. It was going to be a shot brew strung up. Oh, yeah. And with a stubby in each hand and a cigarette ablaze from the lower left. I think that's the Australian that oh. the world wants to see. Something that looks like this. Sitting on top of Richard Gere? Yeah. <laughs> And now the show that has people across the world in 107 countries screaming in unison. I never thought TV could be this good. This week it scooped the pool in the image in the very tricky and highly competitive uh, category for shows under three minutes in length. Let's go and see if the parody's off the purchase. It's time for Terps About the House. Terps About the House you all the talking believe what they say in here anyway yeah but often the stories by John Michael Hollywood house and they come true yeah and often the artists are the last to know that's right read it again um Sam Stain the series has been axed after 10 episodes the program's producer Damien Davis son of golfer Roger Davis said that the realistic nature of the show had made it difficult for the network to find sponsors <laughs> the original sponsor copper art had withdrawn after two episodes. The last Sam goes to air on the 21st of September. Well, that's next week. Yeah, well, we better watch it now then. Yeah. Sam Stay? Frickle? Yeah, thanks, Sam. Do you reckon I need a new hat? I like your hat, Sam. Yeah? Mm. Well, I don't know. You don't think it laughs at my coat? Why not get a new coat? Yeah, that's not a bad idea. Mm. Yeah, maybe I will. Okay. Yeah. Sam, what's up? You look anxious. That was Plunger, about Errol. They don't reckon he's gonna make it. What? Do you know what that means? A promotion. <laughs> Norm knows you and Plunger bashed him up. Christ, you're right. You're right. Oh, Sam. Hang on, babe, I've gotta think this thing through. Now, Plunger came up to me in the pub, and then he said... I think we should punch his head in. I'm for going in with fence palings. <laughs> it was the bloody fence palings that did it. <sighs> what if Norm finds out? Norm? Oh, God. I think the pair of you ought to get over here and put your tossels on the desk. <laughs> Poor Sam. Oh, if he finds out about the fence palings, well, I'm not going to tell him. What about Plunger? Can you trust him? Plunger? I bet I can hit that tree with this can. Yeah, whoever hits it pays for the fish and chips. You're on. You win, Sam. Right. You pay for the fish and chips. <laughs> of course I trust him. We'll be all right, babe. Let's go look at some coats. OK, Sam. Sam, stay. Do you think Terps has seen the article? I think he has. Terms about the house. Earlier this week, uh, the wily old fox in charge of the Essendon Bombers, Kevin Shooty, asked all of Melbourne to come down to the MCG today and support his dons against the might of the West Coast Eagles. And obviously this ploy by Kevin paid off in spades because obviously, as we now know, the dons have clobbered the West Coast Eagles. Now, on the other hand, uh, the wily old fox in charge of the West Coast Eagles, Mickey Malthouse, was furious that the game wasn't being played at Subiaco in Perth because he felt as though his team, having won last week, deserved another home final. Roy, how much in your day was there a home ground advantage mm. uh, when you played, obviously, at Lithgow? Yes. And did you feel as though you knew where to go, what to do, yes. how to behave? 
yes. as opposed to when you played in Orange? Look, <laughs> it, it always was a bit of an advantage at home, yes. uh, HG. We, uh, for example, would have marshals when the team bus from Orange arrived. Uh, the marshals would just say, you can't park here. Yeah. Off you go. Yeah, you can't park here. Get out of here. Off you go. And they'd end up having to park about three miles away, old speak. <laughs> then they'd have to walk all the way back to the ground. In the mean, then they were running late, mm. and we'd be out in the middle booting the ball around, talking to the ref, having jokes, <laughs> you know, talking to the locals. Mm. And uh, kiddies were always, uh, we always felt, HG, that kiddies were worth about 20 points. Because wow. uh, if any of uh, the players from Orange, uh, for example, came by car, we'd give the kiddies two bob pieces. Uh, and they'd go and do a bit of two-bob detail yeah. to the car. <laughs> <laughs> and we let the player know who came in that car, you know, hey, number 10, where the kids are over near your falcon with some loose change. <laughs> you big goose. <laughs> and you'd see they were distracted, you know. You'd see the damage to the car. You know, the kiddies would stand over the players' race at half time and hack on them. Yeah. They'd, oh, you've got a They'd bang on the on, on the doors and on the walls so they couldn't hear the coach giving them instructions. Uh, you know what I mean? Uh, we put they put fish heads in the in the team bus. For when they went home, they'd spray paint duds on the side of the bus, <laughs> let down a couple of tyres, and they'd hurl rocks at them while they were out there trying to fix it up. That is a hometown advantage. Oh, I hated coming to Lithgow. <laughs> no, it was a real advantage. No, I, 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 I thought it was worth 20 or 30 points, though, in the real advantage. Now, I really... Mind you, I hated travelling. Oh, yes, yes. What was the worst place for you to go? Orange. Person? And why is that? <laughs> they did the same to us. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I remember you'd been to Lithgow. Uh, now, uh, Roy, obviously you can break it down into three uh, three distinct areas. You've got your crowd, yeah. you've got your culture, which you, I think you've adequately explained, but the culture. local weather knowledge, oh, yeah. that was always a, a tricky thing. Oh, you, you know, yes. you could read the signs in the sky, know which way, whether to run yeah. with the wind or run with the, That's you right. know, wait for the change and run yeah. with the wind in both halves and all that sort yeah. of stuff. Because often the wind would turn like that, you oh, know, at three minutes to three, it'd be, a, you know, a big westerly. Yeah. But you knew right at three o'clock, yeah. it was going to become an easterly. Yeah. That's right. So you say, well, we'll go this way. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, well, that great one, of course, at uh, running with the westerly in the first half, it changes at 20, at 20 to, four, to 4, and then <laughs> back it goes the other way, just in time for you to clean up in the second half. Yeah. Now, uh, w is, the, is, the, is this the same today? I raise this question because we see so many football labels on television. You know, you'd think the West Coast Eagles would sit in Perth and think, oh, there's the MCG, mm. gee, it looks sort of like that, and it's got sticks at either end, and there's two big ones and two little ones, mm. bit of a boundary line here, and the mm. crowd sit there. You think there wouldn't be be so much yes. advantage today. Obviously, in your day, Lithgow wasn't on television no. a lot. The Lithgow no. Oval, sure. I case when the Queen came, you might be able to get a glimpse of the Oval, but <laughs> <laughs> not generally in playing conditions. And then the same with Orange, you only get a glimpse when the Queen was Orange. Now, has television? Unless you took photographs. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Spies going around taking, you know, sort of 360 degrees, <laughs> yeah, and then going down to Kodak and making them, you know, one hour, and then coming back with all these pictures you didn't know how to fit together. But uh, the point of the matter is, is television level. Out. Do you think Look, I think so, yes. actually. Look, I, I don't think Malthouse has, has got a leg to stand on. See, I, I regard the MCG now as the home of football, football. Uh, the same as the Sydney Football Stadium is the home of Rugby League. Uh, and it should have been for the Eagles something like coming home, uh, you know, because as you say, they've seen it on TV, they've been there many times, uh, the only difference being that they had, what, about 100,000 people who hated their guts. Yeah, <laughs> but you, if you're clever, you can use that to your advantage. Yeah. You just stare them down. You know, you, <laughs> Each individual. You put on a sort of haughty expression. That's right. Just look at them all. Just look at them all. Yeah, what are you doing? <laughs> yeah. I'm just going to let yeah, That's right. Well, uh, obviously the Eagles haven't travelled well all year and uh, today they travelled less well than uh, they have for the rest of the uh, 22 matches. Yeah. Ladies and gentlemen, it's always wonderful to welcome an international artiste back to the bug house after a European sojourn. She was in Germany, wasn't she? She was, yes. Mm. She was uh, uh, recently described by one of Germany's leading critics. De Spiegel. De Spiegel as lascivious, and a sultry, torrid, raunchy, but never lewd. And a wunderkind. Which is a very big rap. Where in this day and age, when the cheap can come so easily, tonight she's supported by Australia's brand new Beatles, uh, lending support on throat the Nissan Cedrics, and on feet Australia's finest contemporary dance ensemble, the driver's side airbags. <laughs> the tune that old hip wriggler, these boots are made for walking. Australia, can you bellow like bulls, squeal like peggies, scratch like uh, fowls, hoot like owls? Can you make the whole barnyard come to life with a bloody big honk of welcome for Monica Trumpiga? <laughs>
was the uh, Brook Shields four-day wedding diet uh, arrangement of these boots are made for walking. Uh, Monica in sizzling form after the European tour. Uh, you know, obviously the Beatles over their runabouts, injuries wise. Uh, the Cedric's all the better for the run for mine. And what about those very safety conscious driver's side airbags? <laughs> Didn't they get the balloon above their guttering with the work in the Raoul Mertens? Uh, and uh, the television world this week was thrilled. Uh, I, I, I believe it was one of the great moments in television this week when we got a geek at this new show, chock-a-block full of the three great things of television, doctors, nurses and humongous prangs. And I refer to the brilliance that is Medivac. Uh, Roy, I believe the world has been screaming out now for months, or no, I take that back, for years, for another doctor hospital yes. rescue style of program. I loved it. What are your impressions so far? You see, I, I think it's pushed the crossbar so impossibly high, yeah. Medivac. Yeah. He's got everything going for it. As you say, it's got action, it's got doctors, mm. it's got disaster. Yes. Uh, I thought the first episode was sensational. When the kitty fell over the precipice and was impaled, <laughs> and then had the presence of mind to roll a reefer <laughs> while he was dying. <laughs> while he was dying and then when he started singing the only one who could ever teach me was the son of a preacher oh. <laughs> i thought who's written this mm. this is pretty wild gear is australia ready is australia ready for this oh. well obviously it was yeah. this was tremendous and then when he died and the doctor sang that to him into his ear with a very very long you know pan Mm. The only one who could ever reach me was the son of a preacher. I mean, I didn't get the significance, I didn't get the symbolism, it didn't oh. matter. No. <laughs> no. It was just extraordinary television. Uh, Roy, what sort of plot lines would you like to see develop over the coming weeks? Uh, oh, uh, you know, neck transplants. Neck transplants. <laughs> I, I've got one in mind, a couple in mind that I'd like to see. Uh, you know, obviously, uh, a lonely sort of figure with a oh, vacuum yeah. cleaner. Oh, yeah. Experimenting uh, with, you know, what you can do with, say, the wedding tackle and the vacuum cleaner. No, I thought like, you were going to say with a platypus. Well, wait a minute, I was going to get that. And then, when an international star comes into the show, like Richard Gere, we could have him in trouble with something... With you a know, platypus? Well, he can't get it off. Yeah. <laughs> well, can't get it out. <laughs> Not in that expression. Anyway, this would be given well, months. Sort of, well, you're giving many back people <laughs> ideas. Too many ideas. <laughs> and speaking of ideas, it's now time to welcome to the Buggy House a woman who got a leg up in the caper with high time. And then made it, uh, made the hard yards look easy in the heartbreak, kid. And cashed in the checks she had already written in uh, Broken Highway. Nissan said, which, can you duck into the caravan and bung on a bit of slap? Can you look relaxed and cool on the set while they fiddle about with the lights and the whatnot? And when the first bellows turn over, mark it. Action! Can you give us the Claudia Carvin story? Picture me star, dancing with light. Picture that star, and this is the sign. Claudia Carvin in front of the lens. Pick any emotion she can pretend. Yes, uh, thanks very much for coming in, Claudia. Now, uh, the new film is Dating the Enemy. And, uh, Dating the Enemy? Uh, yes, known. yes. Now, uh, look, it's a fairly hard, tricky film to explain, but we sh can illustrate it, I think, with two clips we've taken from it. Firstly, you play the part of a science reporter who's got a romance going with the Guy Pearce character who plays the part of a sort of MTV-style TV presenter with a lot of attitude, I think mm -hmm. it's called. Yep. Let's have a look at the scene now with you playing your real selves. Here you are at a party. Taking in the ideas. One thing oh, leads to another. Sure. That's right. <laughs> and here we go. There's a bit of a romance going on here. You look longingly into each other's eyes, and then you think you might swap tongues for a minute or two. There's a bit of a preview to what's going to come up. Moon is a harsh. Uh, oh, wait a minute, boy. Don't give the plot away. Because here it comes. Such a fresh idea of having the moon, a bloody big gap, and then there it is. That's you as your real selves. Then the moon weaves its magic and mm. decides to demonstrate how life can be on the other side. Yeah, have a go at it. <laughs> uh, and uh, swaps you into Guy Pierce's body. Mm. 
It's at a reasonable weight. Your mind yeah, in the guy Pierce's yeah, body. Yeah, something like yeah. that, yeah, yeah. And takes the clothes with him. Now, let's have a look at the no, new characters. You doesn't. discover yourself. You discover yourself here this as somebody you didn't think you were. I.e., your guy. Your guy. You don't look like guy, mind, but you are guy. Yeah. Yeah. With guy's mind. clothes. Yeah, guy's mind and clothes oh. on that. Oh my God! There you go, talking like guy. <laughs> and he's guy. He's stuck with your your gear and <laughs> mine. The door down. And he's shocked. <laughs> Understandably, I'm shocked. I think everybody's shocked. This is and he gets used to it pretty quickly. Is that you? Yes, it's me. Hmm. <laughs> 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 How hard was it to make this film? I mean, it seems almost impossible to... It's really confusing. Mm. Yeah, lots of identity crises. And how did you practice, uh, you know, being the other person? I mean, uh, if you just sort of... Sort of well, about. Uh, we videoed each other, actually. Mm -hmm. A lot of videoing, and I'd go home and watch it. As the characters, of course. Yeah. Yeah, so you take the rushes Well, he, he did all my scenes that I was eventually going to play, yeah. and then I just copied him. So yeah. it, was, it was pretty easy. Was he uh, upset the way you portrayed him? Yes. <laughs> which, yes. Is, which is a terrific job, I must say. It's a wonderful bit of acting like a, a bloke. Yeah, yeah. very blokey. Yeah. And, and uh, how did you feel about the way he per portrayed you as a sort of mincing... Well, not me, Tash. No, yeah, the character. Tash. But did you think you were playing Tash that mincingly? <laughs> <laughs> well... I thought, I thought he did a very good job. Yeah. I mean, he had a hard... He had a... Well, he was nervous and we were all... Well, he had the harder he, role. Because he had the, he'd done the Priscilla thing, yes. and he was worried that he was going to be recreating that. Mm. And so we were concentrated on him not recreating it, and I thought he did a very good job. Yes, right? yes, indeed. Why was he nervous on set, though? Uh, did the director not put him at ease? Didn't you? <laughs> <laughs> no, we ganged up on him. Yeah, so, well, no, you no, would. you can't do it like that. We're girls. We know how to do it. Right, and, yeah. right. So, he, oh, that's And then he yeah. said, no, no, I'm a guy. I know how yeah. to do it, and we'd say, yeah. shut up. I think I read something <laughs> where, where you found, uh, when you were younger, uh, you found you found comedy sort of frivolous and not worth sort of doing. Um, what changed your mind about this? I grew up probably. Watched a bit of you guys, you know, enjoyed a bit of comedy. Yeah. Well, I was going to ask you what you do watch on TV. Did you see Medivac? Did you enjoy that? <laughs> <laughs> Wait till you see the neck transplant show. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, Is it really? Oh, what do you watch on TV? What, what do you? I know you read a lot of books. You really look uh, like Media uh, Watch. Media Watch? Media Watch, <laughs> yes. Yeah, well, everybody that's, watches that's that. That's 15 minutes. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> like calculus I'd last the week sometimes. Um, Simpsons. Oh, yeah? A bit of The Simpsons. Do you watch Seinfeld, for instance? Uh, I've caught a few Seinfeld episodes, mm. yeah. But it doesn't, it's not rusted on. I like watched my Simpsons. first footy game the other day, though. Which code? The Essendon and Oh, you watched the Brisbane. AFL? Essendon. Mm. It was like a kind of chess game, wasn't it? Yeah. Meaty yeah. pawns. Yes, yes. The meaty pawns. That's yeah. not bad. Yeah. That's very good. That's very good. Yeah. Yeah. Did you enjoy it? I did. I only caught like 10 minutes. Yeah. For the 10 minutes, I saw someone got their nose broken and then they plugged it up and sent oh, them yeah. back oh, out. The <laughs> 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 well, even I'm like, yeah. Well, that's football. Yeah, I thought he's only going to get brain damage or something. But... Oh, well, I think you've got to be brain damaged to do it in the first place. Yeah. <laughs> and when you read books, what sort of authors do you like reading? What are you currently hoeing your way through? Um... A uh, bit of Ian McEwan and mm -hmm. Cormac McCarthy, I really mm -hmm. like. Yes. And do you knock them off sort of uh, three or four hours to a book and then get another one out and keep going? Or? No, it depends. If I've got yeah. a lot of time off, I, I read you know, one a week or something, or whatever. Yeah, well, I think you said, you know, the greatest pleasure for you was curling up on a, on a, on a, on, <laughs> say, a rainy day, from. curling yeah. up on a rainy <laughs> day with a good book. <laughs> is that the case? I mean, it is. It's a pretty dull yeah. way to live. I mean, <laughs> you can deny these quotes, of course, Claudia. You don't have to say, I never said that. That was reported by somebody who didn't know what they were talking about. You know, somebody... Oh, I was misquoted. It was taken out of context. Oh, oh, taken out of context. Today, my day off, it wasn't raining at all, but I went to a Jungian dream class, and then yeah. I went to a two-hour yoga class, yeah. And then I've got to come to fuck me. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> that give you well, that does give you a bit of perspective on what Claudia thinks of the show. I'm sorry. You see, these. These Jungian dream classes. <laughs> You're not a double horse by any chance, are you? We've had one of them on tonight already. Uh, now, what do you do with the Jungian dream class? Do you talk about, I mean, do you look for Jungian archetypes? Do you find, and you've got a swearing archetype in you? I mean, <laughs> Tourette's syndrome. Tourette's syndrome. Yeah. <laughs> what 
the bloody hell is a Jungian dream class, for God's sake? What sort of wacko, half-baked, bloody bit of lunacy is this? Does that cause you to swear on television every night after you've been to hang? Does that cause total lack of control? <laughs> Take us through it. <laughs> what do you do when you turn up? Hello, I'm here for the Jungian dream class. Where do you want me to sit? Or do you stay standing? What do you do? Lie down, go to sleep? Well, I'll start swearing on national television out? afterwards. Wake up, madam. That's two hundred dollars. Thanks. <laughs> Come on. What's it about? <laughs> we ran through animals. Animals. Oh, why are the horse breeding again? The free parents. <laughs> what do you mean you went through animals? Oh, what? Today I'm going to sleep like a platypus. <laughs> What a, what a platypus dream. So what's the story? <laughs> we went through, we went through what? <laughs> tigers, mean. Somebody's worked out how dream. tigers dream. And, no, <laughs> what they mean when they come into your dreams, or <laughs> crocodiles, or sharks, or... Yeah. Have you ever met anyone, met anyone outside of Africa, or who doesn't work at a zoo, who's dreamt of a bloody tiger? <laughs> I certainly haven't. And why don't you have cats and dogs and pigeons and... You know, no, so yeah, we Indian minor birds. Dogs and <coughs> mm. geese and swans. Well, what does it mean when you, when you, when you dream about sparrows? <laughs> what does that mean? Apart yeah, from you've dreamt about. Small-minded, maybe. Oh, oh, small-minded. Small-minded, yeah. And has the tiger got a big bloody brain? Is that the idea? <laughs> the tiger means you've probably got something kind of wild in your unconscious that you have to tap into, probably. Oh, oh so. And do you sort of have this picture thing, you know, you held up, this is a tiger. <laughs> if you dream of a tiger, it means you've got something wild inside you, or is it much more sort of... No, it was a good class. It was a good class. Good class, class. Yeah, yeah. It sounds like an absolute bloody waste of time. <laughs> What are your, do you have dreams? Do you dream Yes, much? I do. I dream about people and random events that the subconscious sort of throw in. You know, it, I, I don't think it means much at all. I mean, it, it's just the, the brain going to free will. It's free will. I have really active dreams, so I thought I'd better go and check out what they're all about. Yeah. Uh, they're kind of interesting. Active You know, dreams. I think the best thing is, is not to think about them. Really? It can just confuse you. Just get on with your life. Just, have you just wake video. up, put your socks on, put the undies on, get on with life, <laughs> and don't bloody worry about it. <laughs> and look how Roy's turned out. You'd hate to turn yeah, exactly. out like Roy, wouldn't you? That's right. Look, we could talk all night, but it's now time to test Claudia's knowledge of the high diddle little caper. Fruits, 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 fruits of football. Yes, once again, it's time to play the fabulous Fruits of Football. Roy, who will Claudia be playing for this evening? Uh, Claudia will be playing for Linda Anslow, who turns 29 here in the room tonight. Where are well, you? Linda, where are you, Maddie? Well done, Linda. <laughs> yes, and let's go over to Ian Turps Toby and see what's available on the prize board. Thank you, H.G. Yes, in the Club Buggery show back tonight, we have the Parrots on the Perch T-shirt, the ever-popular Turps about the house plates, Monica's House, featuring our own lovely Monica Tropica and the brand new Club Buggery playing cards. And now back to you, HG, for the fabulous fruits of football. Yes, and I must say, these new Club Buggery cards, well, they're just exciting. Look, they're I've leaping got, out of the box. I've got they? the Queen of Dates here. I don't know whether you can see that, the light there, the Queen of Dates. I've got my poker face on. Poker what are you? Face I've got the Jack of Tools, and he's yes. a real beauty. <laughs> Look, here's the Nine of Tools. That's not about it. I've got the Five of Dates. Five of Dates. The Eight of Dates. The Eight of Dates. Let's have a look at that one to pick them. There's a beauty there. I hope there's you don't cards. start dreaming about those. <laughs> And we can't find any snags. I'm not quite sure. Oh, yeah, I've got a snag. Oh, you've got snags. Got snags. So got the four, four suits snags. are dates, Spanners. dates, tools. tools, snags, and I've forgotten. Pipes, isn't it? Flutes. 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 Recorders? No, oh, well, flutes, actually. Flutes, okay. Now, I'm going to ask you two questions, Claudia. You've only got to get one right. You can put the cards down now. No, thanks. People might think the answers are on there. <laughs> Question one. Uh, what international rugby league forward associated with South St Manly has been appearing in a yet-to-be-completed Australian feature film set in the outback? Is it A, Nick Koseff, B, Steve Menzies, C, Ian Roberts, D, Craig Salvatore... Ian Roberts, it is. <laughs> well done. Question two. Which former AFL player appeared in the US action adventure series called Highwayman? Was it Rod Grinter, Mark Jackson, Robert Dipodomenico, or Alex Jezelenko? 
Mark Jackson. Mark Jackson! Absolutely, on that wonderful well winning night, it's time to ask Paulie to deliver the buggery show bag. And I ask, I wish her every success in the future, and I ask everyone, whether here in the 25 million or there at home, to get them out and bang them. And bang them until they look like nothing more than a couple of Thai-style barbecued chicken drumsticks. As a way of thanking Claudia Carbon! <laughs> Now, th something very special and exclusive to the Bug House, apart from the interest in dreams. Uh, after earlier success this year with a number of cricket uh, operas, the Australian Opera has come on board Club Buggery's Footy Finals Opera Project. Our first selection is entitled Spanner in the Works. We pick up the action in Act 1, Scene 3, in which the Wayne Carey, the North Melbourne superstar, makes his long-awaited appearance before the tribunal. No, more professional. They hit all their marks. Now, when Mike Willisie was here in the 25 million earlier this evening, he selected a couple of club bug members who could make a bill. Bloody big squeak. And uh, <laughs> let's face it, they were pretty well dressed at the time. And uh, so, uh, Roy, what have we got in the club buggery toolbox that celebrates that endeavour in the tricky fashion caper? Hey, see, we've got the new logo <laughs> for the Sydney Olympics. Doesn't it look smart? We uh, discussed it earlier, and obviously it's very, very ordinary. Yes. We have uh, 300,000 for, 300, for that. We have one Ken Doan submitted, yes. uh, which I like. Yes. And
and it doubles because if you turn it on the side, it's just like a cocky. Here's yeah. the crest, here's the beak, etc., yeah. etc. Et Work it out. This yourself. one was submitted by Mike Willisey, yes. which is a bit <laughs> swan centric for mine. Yes. But still, a good. good go. This one was submitted by Brett Whiteley, yes. which I like. Yes. Uh, I think that would send a terrific signal right across the world. Yes. Uh, Pro Heart put one in, HG. That's the pro. Golden rings here on the tree. Golden rings. Yes, very good. Uh, and we've got one uh, that was put in by Manning Clark that I don't think was taken very, very seriously. <laughs> I like this. I like it. Yes. Uh, we've got the port. Yes, the port, and it's a beautiful Olympic, uh, Olympic flavour to it. It's, it's well, you know, the percentage of alcohol that we just doesn't mean anything about. Oh, it's just massive. Uh, we've got a, a, a tea towel, actually, yes. with a Sydney, uh, Sydney Australia on it. That's a yes. beauty. And uh, when Rooting King found out that Sydney had the games, he did this up himself of his own volition. There's the king, <laughs> looking so haughty and proud. And when the Dalai Lama burst into Sydney this afternoon, or it might have been Melbourne, he said, by golly, that rooting king could do it. <laughs> oh, rooting king could do it. He could do it off his face. He could do it in a coma. He could do it out of space. That arty, classy, Mr. Darcy rooting king. Congratulations. Well done. What's your name? David. David, well done. Share it with your mates. Now, an old mate of mine, uh, Ted Mullery, has got in touch with me about some dates that the Ted Mullery gang will be doing. And well, the gang's still out and the about. The gang are out and about, and look out, South Australia. Lock up your mums because the gang's coming! Uh, it's in Mildura on the uh, 3rd and the 10th, and I use that word it advisedly. It's in Wyala at the Sandowner on the 4th of the 10th. It's in Port Lincoln at the Tasman Hotel on the 5th of the 10th. God, they get around that gang. They must have fresh horses every day. Uh, and in Adelaide at the Arkham. But God, what a place the Arkham is. It's, no. just a, it's just a mine of entertainment. On the, the gang's going to tear them apart. It, yeah. it will knock them dead. And Roy, where are you off to this week? Uh, actually, I, I saw last night uh, the... the uh, uh, Mayanna Gilgood's farewell with the Australian Ballet yes. uh, and that uh, marvellous bit of gear, these new Australian ballets. Uh, I, I was so taken by them, I'm going to go to Melbourne to, to, to see oh, yeah. them. They're a terrific bit of work. I, I love the fitness, I love the movement. It's pure Australia, so I'll be there. That's what I'll be doing. Uh, and uh, as well as that, I'm going to go along to see Planet uh, Comedy with uh, Anthony Ackroyd, Tommy Dean and James O'Loughlin oh. this coming weekend at the Harborside Brasserie. And of course, let's not forget the Community Aid Abroad door knock that begins across Australia this week. All and week. All week. Sadly, we come to the end of another show uh, as we sign off from the Johnny Bertrand missing 25 million here. Roy and I would like to thank Mike Willisey, Claudia Carbon, the Nissan Cedrics, the, uh, the driver's side airbags, Monica Trafficker, the brand new Beatles, Ian Terps, Turpy, the Australian Opera, the cast of a country practice, and you, the audience, whether here in the 25 million or there at home, thanks once again for taking an interest. And finally, it's time to pay tribute once again to the golden years of the Trocadero. This evening, in front of the pot plants and under the twirling mirror ball of romance in the Troc, we have a man whose action thrilled us last year when he packed down in the pivotal performance as Bob the Neighbour in the hit series Ian. His selection, well, it's that old family sing-along, so wake up, Grandma, wake up, Grandad, it's jump in my car. It's the man who taught Terps everything he knows about the business, which isn't a lot. Please welcome <laughs> into your homes and into your hearts, Mr. Ted Mulray! See you next week, Hi. once again, we ring and